It's Tuesday, July 26th. From inside the WTOP newsroom, this is the DMV Download, brought to you by the men and women of Steamfitters Local 602. Get an estimate and learn more at steamfitters-602.org. Today, monkeypox is on the rise. And while many may have not thought much about this emerging virus, our region is seeing higher numbers than other parts of the country. And D.C. Health is responding in kind by changing up how it's giving out vaccines. And the reality is there's just not enough product out there yet. Uh, We know that more is coming, but we can't wait. And we also talk about how this virus is starting to infect people outside of the at-risk LGBTQ community. The more population spillover that we see, the more likelihood that we could have this disease around for a long period of time. Thanks for joining us. I'm Luke Garrett. And I'm Megan Cloherty. The district has one of the highest rates of the virus in the country. And we know, obviously, from the spread of COVID, it does not take long for a virus to cross state lines. As health directors across our region get ready for the likely surge of monkeypox across our area, starting today, D.C. is shifting its strategy in addressing the outbreak. The health department is now prioritizing giving one dose of the limited monkeypox vaccines instead of giving eligible residents a two-dose regimen. In short, they are stretching out their supply. To understand why, we're bringing in Senior Deputy Director at D.C. Health, Patrick Ashley. Patrick, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. So just to start off, why is the district changing its strategy with its monkeypox vaccine rollout? So, you know, we have uh, gotten so far from the federal government about 14,000 doses of vaccine. And, you know, that's not enough. We've talked very publicly about the fact that we need about 100,000 doses of vaccine. Uh, And what we've seen is that this outbreak continues to grow. And so, you know, by taking 14,000 courses of vaccine, which would actually be about 7,000 people, uh, what we did was we looked at the data and said that the data shows that the vaccine provides uh, effectiveness for up to six months or longer uh, if we make it a one dose product. And so what we decided to do was uh, to temporarily postpone individual second dose so that we can get more individuals vaccinated. And when we talk about containing a, a, a virus, we're really looking at containment about how do we get our, our arms around it as quickly as possible. And so having more people vaccinated allows us to slow the spread down even faster. Does the limited amount of vaccine have anything to do with DC statehood? Um, I know with COVID, there was an issue of getting Uh, vaccine initially. Is that the same situation here? No, we've been working very closely with our counterparts at the federal government. They've been prioritizing those cities that have the largest outbreaks. Okay. Um, And so they've given us a fair allocation uh, based on their formula. Uh, We continue to advocate for more, but so does every other jurisdiction. The reality is there's just not enough product out there yet. Uh, We know that more is coming, but we can't wait until that time, which is why we made such a a decision to to change from a one or two dose to one dose. Mm -hmm. And just to review here, eligibility for these vaccines is limited to the most at-risk populations in D.C. That's gay and bisexual men and transgender women who have sex with men as well as sex workers. But do you expect eligibility to expand once D.C. gets more monkeypox vaccines? I hope it doesn't have to expand. Uh, and that's part of the reason why we're, we're being very aggressive with getting vaccination out there. Uh, the reality is that we don't want to see a world in which everyone needs this. Uh, and so that's why the quicker we can get vac- individuals vaccinated, contain this outbreak, the less likelihood we'll have to expand that. Patrick, is there any concern, I mean, off of Luke's question just now, about monkeypox kind of being stigmatized to the gay and transgender population? It reminds me of HIV back in the day and people thought, oh, this isn't going to happen to me. But this isn't an STD, right? Yeah, you're absolutely right. And it's something that that we don't want stigmatized as a a gay man myself. You know, I don't want any more stigma associated with 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 this, you know, to be a gay disease or or not. But I mean, the reality is, you know, this is this is a very touchy topic, right? We want to get education out to the population that's being affected the most. Uh, and we want those individuals to take precautions uh, and to be able to protect them. And so, you know, we've got to balance that messaging very carefully to make sure that we're targeting individuals uh, who might be at risk. It's the same reason why the vaccine is not available to the general population. When we look at 14,000 doses, if we spread that across the entire population, it really wouldn't give us any sort of coverage that's meaningful. Uh, we, we look at the outbreak data to show it's occurring in this population. And so we take aggressive action to make sure that we're addressing 
addressing that population Mm -hmm. so that we don't have spillover into other communities. And that's what we're really trying to prevent. You know, there's been a lot of conversations nationally about, you know, is this going to become endemic? And the more population spillover that we see, the more likelihood that we could have this disease around for a long period of time. And so, again, those efforts are very purposely concentrated. We heard that there was a baby or a child who got this. And can you talk about how it spreads? Because I've heard, too, it's skin. It can be skin to skin if there's an open sore, possibly. Yeah, so it can be skin to skin. Uh, it can also be, uh, you know, through uh, respiratory droplets. So kissing uh, is also another way that this can be spread. It can also be uh, spread from the mother to the placenta to the baby. Mm. Uh, it can be spread that way through pregnant women. And so that's why any sort of close, intimate contact, and we talk about the fact that it's not an STD, right? Because you can be touching someone in, in other ways that is not sexual uh, and transmit the disease. And that's what we think happened here with this, uh, this baby, uh, that it was some sort of other contact you know, interacting with uh, some other person that was probably holding and loving on that baby who had a sore and was just not that aware of what was going on. And that's why we really have been, you know, talking to people about the importance of like knowing your body, uh, mm-hmm. seeing if there's a rash on your body, if, even if it's a pimple or an ingrown hair, we see that sometimes monkeypox presents that way. And we want people to be very aware of that and talk to their physician about getting tested. And so before we go any further, let's quickly review, you know, how do you get a vaccine against monkeypox if you're in that eligible group? Yeah, so here in D.C., uh, if you pre-register at preventmonkeypox.dc.gov, uh, you can go online and uh, list, uh, provide us your information and your risk factors, uh, and then we'll contact you when there's an appointment available uh, so that you can get that. Uh, there's appointments available. Uh, we have clinics that operate Sunday through Fridays, uh, and, and they're available throughout all parts of the city. And, and yesterday, uh, we announced that we'll be opening a new monkeypox clinic uh, in the east of the river as well, and so making this accessible to everyone. And Patrick, you've been working at DC Health throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. And just to you know, help us all kind of calibrate this risk and where we are with monkeypox, how would you compare the two? You know, I think, you know, it, they're very different, uh, but they're very similar, right? The way that we look at and approach disease investigation and disease containment are very similar. Uh, the good news here is that, you know, COVID is much more contagious, right? And and the monkeypox is not nearly as contagious as that. It requires, you know, individuals to actually be coming in contact with individual. And so we're very fortunate in that we've only seen uh, today 179 cases Uh, And, you know, where we saw COVID really took off and exploded and all of a sudden it was throughout the community Mm -hmm. and it essentially became unstoppable to what we know it is today. Monkeypox is still something that we can prevent. Uh, It's still something that we can address and we want people to get vaccinated. We need more vaccine to be able to do that. But we also want people to be cognizant of, you know, signs and symptoms that they're seeing on their bodies. You mentioned the numbers off the top. We have 14,000 doses we need 100,000. That's a significant disparity. Are you anticipating you'll need 100,000? Or are you, you know what I mean? Like, is that now? Or is that what you think you'll need? And how are you working with Montgomery County, Fairfax County, Arlington to, I mean, obviously these things, as we know from COVID, it doesn't just stay in DC. People go different places and meet with friends and whatever. How, How are you guys mitigating that? Yeah, so the 100,000 number that we've talked about is really about, you know, we we believe that there's about 50,000 people that are eligible based on our current eligibility criteria. Gotcha. And that's a guess, right? We don't we don't know. Uh, and we know that not everybody's going to want it. And we know that the population may expand or contract a little bit in terms of who is eligible. Uh, and so, you know, we're really trying to get uh, our hands around you know, how do we get those individuals vaccinated? And and you asked about Maryland and Virginia and our neighbors. Our local epidemiologists meet once a day with our counterparts across the river. Uh, At the state health officer level, we're meeting once a week uh, with the health officers from Virginia and Maryland to make sure that we have a coordinated approach. But the reality is Maryland and Virginia also don't have enough doses. Mm. Uh, they, they actually are getting far less doses than we are. Uh, and so, you know, we're working very hard. We're working collectively. But the, the reality is that, you know, we're, we're still waiting on more doses. That's interesting. So it's more of a like a information campaign, because I want to ask you, like, what are they talking about? How could you possibly coordinate something like this when really, like you said, it's about knowing your body, knowing the symptoms? Do you know what, what kind of conversations they're having? Yes. A lot of it is about, you know, what sort of messaging are we doing? What sort of approaches are we taking to make sure that, you know, we're matching up eligibility? Uh, and so we, what we want to make sure we're doing is we're seeing act the, actually the same type of cases in Maryland and Virginia, just like COVID when we detect new variants, uh, you know, we're seeing different presentations of monkeypox. And mm. so 
we're constantly comparing notes to say, you know, this person presented with a rash that looks like this, and we've never seen this before in monkeypox. And so we want to make sure that we're providing that same information to our physicians and to our healthcare community and the public. This is an evolving situation. We know a lot about monkeypox. It's been around for a long time, but we're seeing different presentations and we're seeing this affect communities differently. Uh, and so we're, we're constantly sharing that information about cases and, and strategies. Hmm. And is DC Health considering any other mitigation efforts outside of targeted vaccines? You know, when we went through COVID, obviously there were multi-step processes, masks, um, business regulations. Is there anything like that in the playbook for DC Health when looking at monkeypox? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, you know, and we were asked this question last night at the, the community town hall about monkeypox about, you know, could we create some sort of exposure notification system like we have on our phones. Uh, the reality is that monkeypox is is very different uh, in terms of the way that it's spread, but there's also a lot of things that we can learn uh, from monkeypox or from COVID, I mean, and apply that to, to monkeypox. Um, specifically, the way that, you know, we're washing our hands, the way that we're uh, disinfecting environments and making sure that we just have general good hygiene. Uh, and so I don't think you'll expect to see that there's going to be some sort of restrictions that come out. Uh, there's some people that have said, you know, we need to wear masks for monkeypox and we need to do this, that, and the other. You know, I don't think we're returning to that environment because the disease is not that. It's not COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but it is something that we want to make sure that we're providing good guidance on. We're telling people how that they can contract it, what they can do. Uh, and it's also important to note that if individuals contract monkeypox, there are treatments available for it. There's a product called T-pox. We want to make sure that people actually are getting access to that product. Uh, and so making sure that physicians are aware of how those individuals can get it, because it really helps to reduce the symptoms of, of monkeypox. Is that just like an oral medication or is it a cream? Yeah, so it's an oral medication. There's also an IV product. It's only available through your physician. So the health department will supply it to your physician and they can prescribe it. Hmm. Uh, and it really helps to reduce the length and severity of symptoms. Right. And last week, I talked to Dr. Tara Palamore, a professor and doctor of infectious diseases at George Washington University. She's actually treating monkeypox cases in D.C. right now. And she really echoed what you're saying, that this T-pox treatment is really working for monkeypox patients. I've used it now in a number of patients myself with great outcomes and really improves symptoms very quickly. Do you, do you think that there's a little bit of fatigue here because people's guards have been up for so long? We hear about this new thing. We're like, OK, what? What's monkey pot? You know, I think a lot of people it, it hit your radar and it's almost like we can't even handle <laughs> learning about yet another virus. Are, are you seeing that? Is that part of the challenge here in, in reaching the public? Yeah, you know, I, I think you're you're absolutely right. I think there's there's certainly COVID fatigue amongst the public, amongst uh, everyone. Uh, and, you know, I think there are some people that are very, uh, you know, aware of what monkeypox is. And, and we're very fortunate that the community that this is affecting right now the most um, is very, you know, conscious of their health, very, you know, understanding of uh, when to go and get STD checks and, mm -hmm. and things like that. But there's a large portion of the population that doesn't know a lot about monkeypox, even within the LGBTQ space. This is not something you want. This is not chicken pox, right? This is incredibly painful. Um, it's incredibly debilitating. Uh, and so we don't want individuals to just treat this lightly and just like it's any other sort of, you know, uh, cold that they might catch. Mm. Awesome. Senior Deputy Director at DC Health, Patrick Ashley. Thanks for joining us today and giving us kind of the lowdown here on what we need to know about monkeypox. Thanks for having me. And after the break, we talked to Megan about her week-long vacation and how it did not go as planned. Backed by the experience of its hardworking members, Steamfitters Local 602 is ready to take on your next commercial heating, cooling, HVAC, or refrigeration project. Steamfitters Local 602 adds value to our community through its partnerships with local contractors and building owners, all while keeping the focus on improving the lives of its members and their families throughout the DMV. For work that's on time and on budget, go to steamfitters-602.org to schedule your next project. That's steamfitters-602.org. Steamfitters Local 602 changing lives. Thanks for listening to the DMV Download. If you like this show, give us five stars and leave us a review on Apple Podcast. We love hearing from you guys and your reviews really do help other listeners find this, our area's only in-depth daily local news podcast. And thank you for making us a part of your day. And before we go, Megan's back. I'm <laughs> I appreciate the enthusiasm. I've been am, here the whole show, but yes, I am back. I, I'm back from the dead. 
Wow. No, not really. I mean, I almost. Well, tell us. What happened? Okay, I got COVID. I got COVID. Not, I mean, everyone's had it at this point. Almost everybody. Um, it was the first time for me, though. Wow. So, and and just as COVID does, it arrived at a really opportune time when I opportune. was about to start my vacation. Ugh. A whole week of vacation blown. So, yeah. But you're back. Yeah, I am well rested. I'll, I can say that. That's good. Um, and it was funny because um, my husband got it first, and then I was annoyed because we weren't going on vacation. And then I got it, mm. and I got it way worse. Really? Which was just such a bummer because you kind of want to be like, no, I'm invincible. Totally. You know, like I'm not going to, it's not going to hit me that hard. It's still a thing. And then it did. And I lost taste and smell for a couple of days, which <laughs> oh, no. totally stunk because when you're eating something you don't know, like it's like that tastes. It's in the shape of a zucchini, but it doesn't taste like anything. It tastes like a cold piece of. I don't when know. did you realize? Oh my! God, I re- when I lost my taste and smell. Yeah. <laughs> when I was in the shower, because it was like the morning I was taking a shower, and usually my shampoo smells like flowers or whatever, and I was like, "Oh no, I'm not smelling anything." And then oh I picked no. up the bar of soap, and I try like put it right up to my nose, and it didn't smell like anything, and I just like. Put it on my tongue. <laughs> like, I just, like, rubbed it on my tongue, and I was like, oh, no, I lost both. You couldn't taste and the it was soap. So we- I couldn't taste the soap. And the weirdest thing, I could just, like, feel the bubbles, like, popping on my tongue. Wow. I was like, no. Wow. It was such a weird thing, too, because I don't know if this has ever, ever happened to anybody. Um, a friend of mine, this happened to with zinc. He took, t- like, I don't okay. know. He had a weird reaction to zinc, and he lost his taste and smell. Mm-hmm. But um, it's weird because you still want things. Like, you yeah. still want the things you like. Like, you're still hungry. Yeah, and yeah. you want like popcorn or whatever, and then you eat it, and you're like, "Nope, that is not. Dang. Doesn't taste like this anything. Is just a pure supplement, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> for my body. And your brain's like, "I'm not getting what I wanted." You're wow. Like, oh, sorry, brain. Yeah. Well, it's back though, right? Taste and smell. Taste back. and smell's back. Good. Yeah, a little congestion, but I'm I'm free and clear. I'm negative, and now for six months, Luke, I'm invincible. You're clear. Yeah, <laughs> your antibodies are just flexing. <laughs> yeah, or... they better be, man. Yeah. For loss of vacation. Anyway, I'm back, so I appreciate the warm welcome. We're glad you're back. (laughs) And uh, that'll do it for us today on the DMV Download. We're brought to you by Steamfitters Local 602. Our managing editor is Craig Schwab, and our music is by Real World. Give us a review and rate our show if you get the chance. And while you're there, subscribe so you don't miss a show. You can also find out more about this podcast at dmvdownload.com. Let's see if I can remember this. The DMV Download is a product of WTOP News. You can listen at WT... Nope. Nope. You can listen on 103.5 <laughs> FM in D.C., 107.7 <laughs> FM in Virginia, 103.9 FM in Frederick, Maryland. Is oh, that yeah. right? Yeah. Online at WTOP.com and on the WTOP News app. Thanks for being with us. Megan's got it. Boom. <laughs> Have a good night. <laughs>